Hello, I'm Janet Smith. I'm a professor of philosophy at the University of Dallas. And this is the fourth of eight of an eight part series on sexual ethics. And I've been covering the natural law uh, understanding of ethics and particularly of sexual ethics. And I've also covered John Paul II's personalism and the way that he understands the human person and what light that sheds on sexuality. Last time we covered both his metaphysical analysis of love, where he described what the human person is and informed us that the only proper response to a human person is the response of love. And then he, discovered, he discussed the psychological uh, aspects of love, where he moved us through sensuality, sentimentality, uh, and integration of love into betrothed love and the, and the proper love of a, of a human person. And we finish by a fairly brief discussion of the virtue of chastity, or the virtue of self-control, which means that one is able to put one's sexual desires in service of a higher good, in service of one's devotion and admiration and love of a human person. There's one part of chastity that I did not have time to cover last time, which I'd like to at least touch upon this time. And this is the, an analysis of shame, right? Shame's an interesting phenomenon. It was covered uh, by a, a philosopher named Max Scheler in very great detail. And John Paul II, being a very voracious reader and a, and a very uh, a philosopher who wants to explore all aspects of philosophy, was very taken. In fact, did a, did a study of the works of, of Max Scheler. And Max Scheler, again, did a, an intensive study of different emotions of man, was very interested in the emotive aspect of man's life. And as John Paul II said, love and sex cannot be separated from emotions. And one of the primary emotions here to pay some attention to is the emotion of shame. Now he understands, both Max Scheler and John Paul II, understand shame in a very positive way, right? That it's, it's a good internal check. We've talked about uh, natural law being based upon the man having certain natural inclinations and these natural inclinations are good. Man again has this natural inclination towards uh, the enjoyment of sexual pleasure. A male has a natural attraction, a natural inclination to a female, and a female has a natural inclination towards a male. These are good things. They bring us together. They create love, happiness, family, children. It's a good thing, right? But at the same time, as we have mentioned earlier on, acting uh, indiscriminately upon one's passions and one, on mo one's emotions and one's desires and inclinations can be disastrous. They can lead us to weigh 350 pounds. They can lead us not to get out of bed in the morning, and they can lead us to form sexual unions with people who are are highly uh, inappropriate for us to uh, engage in such unions. So one of the, one of the ch internal checks that we have for acting upon our sexual inclination is a counter check, which is the check of shame. He says it's a very good thing because shame, in a certain sense, protects a value. We have a sense that sexuality should not be a public thing. It really should be a private thing. And we're embarrassed to be caught naked. We're embarrassed to be caught uh, in the sexual act. We think this is inappropriate because this is somehow essentially a private thing. It belongs simply to two people. And it's not in, in any sense meant to be shared um, with others. And this is, I'd like to read another paragraph from John Paul II that, uh, from his Love and Responsibility that discusses shame. He says, uh, the experiences which go with shame are rightly described as intimate. Men and women avoid other people, avoid being seen when they make love. And any, any morally sound human being would consider it extremely indecent not to do so. There is here a sort of discrepancy between the objective importance of the act of which we have spoken before and the shame which surrounds it in people's minds and which has nothing to do with prudery or false shame. It is a proper shame since there are profound reasons for concealing manifestations of love between man and woman and particularly marital intercourse from the eyes of other people. Love is a union of persons brought about in this instance by physical intimacy and intercourse. This last consists in a shared experience of sexual values which make possible mutual sexual enjoyment for both man and woman. The shared experience of sexual values may be inseparably bound up with love, may find its objective justification and foundation in love. This is, in fact, is the way towards overcoming shame in the persons taking part in the sexual act. We shall speak of this more particularly elsewhere. Now he's saying two things here at least. One is that shame is good. It protects the values of sexuality. And secondly, that love helps us overcome shame, all right? That if we were, were totally given to shame, we might never want to get undressed in front of another person. But he says love will move us to want to do that, all right? 
but love should also make us not want to do that in inappropriate places. We don't see so much of this in the United States, at least not the place I frequent, as you find in, in Europe, especially I spent a year in Rome, and you would constantly find people nearly making love in, in public places. Constant embarrassment. You always wanted to avert your eyes and say, I really shouldn't be watching this. Of course, you have a curiosity, as we do when you watch films and elsewhere. You have a curiosity, but you also feel embarrassed and ashamed to watch other people who seem to have no shame. And our grandmother certainly would have said, he has no respect for her, and she has no respect for herself. That they're doing something in public that really only belongs in private. Now, one way of seeing this, one way of always getting in touch with these things is often to think of yourself, if you are a parent, to think about being a parent. If you're not, to think about what it might be like, and what you would want your daughter to be doing. And would you want certain pictures of your daughter to be hung up in, in newsstands and in, in garages? You say no, because somehow that's shameful. It's embarrassing that those sexual aspects of a person aren't for public viewing. And this is something that, that we're going to move towards, is to see that our sexuality actually doesn't belong to ourselves. Actually, it's something that belongs to our spouse. That, our, that what is sexual about us, it certainly is ours, but it's ours to give away, and it's ours to give away to only one person. And it belongs as much in a certain sense to that person as it does to us. It's our gift uh, to that person. And to give it away publicly, to give it away by, by making out in public, or to give it away by appearing in, in, paper, in, in pictures in, in a scantily clad fashion, is really to give away something that belongs to someone else, and is to treat something that belongs to, in a private sphere, bringing it into um, the public sphere. So John Paul II finds this impulse of shame or modesty, he says, to be extremely important. He says both men and women, to some sense, need to learn it, but in some sense, natively have it that girls need to recognize that the way that they dress has an impact on males, and that this is an impact that they shouldn't want to be having, even though they enjoy having it, but they shouldn't want to be having it on any male except, except the one to, for whom they want to give themselves um, completely. And so they should be dressing, dressing modestly. And that males need to realize that their sexual desires, again, they may have these spontaneous reactions, but they want to step back from them and be modest about them so they can treat the beloved uh, with some respect. He tells us then that once one gets married, that there is no reason any longer to be shamed of one's sexual powers and one's sexual um, being. He says, there is no reason for shame or concealment of the values of sex in a truly loving relationship. There is no danger that they might obscure the value of the person or destroy its inalienability and inviolability, reducing it to the status of an object of use. There is no longer any reason to be ashamed of the body once the positive urge to inspire love, which is a part of that shame, has met with an adequate response. Okay. There is no reason to be ashamed of the body once the positive urge to inspire love, which is a part of that shame, has been met with an adequate response. Now, what does this mean? It means that this love, again, has, this sexual urge has been met with an adequate response. It's been put in a relationship where all those goods of sexuality can be realized and honored. And one no longer needs to be ashamed of these sexual impulses. One needs to say, now they're just, they're delightful. Uh, I remember one of my friends who, again, he and his wife had, had enjoyed the incredible uh, and considerable accomplishment, I don't know if it's incredible, but considerable accomplishment of remaining chaste before marriage. They did not have sexual intercourse before marriage, and because they greatly loved each other, and they knew that this love could carry them into marriage, and there'd be something damaging to their relationship if they had sexual intercourse before marriage. And I remember shortly after he was married, you know, he had this great sort of um, the cat who ate the mouse grin. And he said, you know, now everything is okay. Everything that before we tried to stay away from is now okay. And this amazing sense of euphoria, this amazing sense that we have protected something as a great gift, and now we can enjoy it without any sense of dirtiness or naughtiness about it. And I've heard people speak in this way, people who've had sexual intercourse before marriage. One woman told me, she said that she and her husband, um, it took years for them before they were able to have sexual intercourse without thinking of it as being naughty. Because they had had sexual intercourse before marriage, and of course they were ashamed. They would run around and sneak here and there and hide here and there and lie about it. So all of a sudden, sex seemed to them to be something naughty. Whereas my friends, who had remained chaste before marriage, sex didn't seem naughty at all. Sex seemed to be something that was absolutely a beautiful expression of the love between the two of them. 
So this is what he's been saying here, is that if you, if you keep sex for the proper place, which is marriage, you're going to have this wonderful experience that's free from shame, free from embarrassment, that it allows you to be spontaneous and free because you have treated the other person as a person by remaining chaste until marriage. And so you are able then to enjoy sex with this person as something that is, again, free from shame. Now we're going to move to another uh, phase of the discussion where we'll be covering what are different violations of the goods of sexuality. But we'll review in more or less our, our natural law way, to some extent with personalism drawn into it, what are the norms and values of sexuality. If you want to do some additional reading on this subject, you'd want to look at the Universal Catechism and also a document that was put out in 1975 called the Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith uh, in Latin, Persona Humanae. And in this are, just, are covered many of the different, again, sins against sexuality, different violations of the goods of sexuality. Now, we've been talking again with natural law, saying we have this natural inclination, this natural desire to have sexual intercourse. Again, we want to say, but it has to be in accord with the truth. We have to act in accord with what is true. We can't make reality be what we want it to be. We have to live in accord with it. Some people want to say, well, I can have sex outside of marriage and not get hurt. I can have sex with a mistress and not get hurt. You say, can you? <laughs> can you really? Is it really possible? Or is there a certain reality that sex, again, is an expression of love for another, it's for union and intimacy, and that sex means that you must respect the personhood of the beloved, you must love the beloved. And so we're saying here that, that there, oh, excuse me, I, I skipped this, that sex is the uh, source for, I'm not, not cer certain how we have it, sex is the, the source of new life. We have these two goods of, of sexual intercourse. One is it's for union, and one is it is for babies. And this is what happens, again, when you have sex. And then if you're not prepared for these eventualities, you ought not to be having um, sexual intercourse. So we can formulate, if you want, a general rule or a principle or a norm, and you say you should act chastely in regard to your sexuality. You should use your sexuality responsibly. Now the question is, what does that mean? What does it mean to use sexual intercourse again responsibly? Our claim here is that if you're going to express intimacy or love for uh, another, then you have to respect, again, the personhood of the other. We're going to talk about this. We're going to move very quickly to the notion of a monogamy and faithfulness and indissolubility are all ways in which you respect the personhood of the beloved. We're going to talk about sexual intercourse as the source for new life, and we formulate a principle, respect the goods of procreation, be prepared to meet the needs of children. We're going to talk about different ways which are violations of this kind of good behavior. Now, we're moving for what we call general precepts to particular norms. Right? There's always two kinds of norms. There are negative norms and positive norms, negative precepts and positive precepts. I should have put the positive ones first. I'll talk about those first. But positive precepts always mean you tell someone to do something, not not to do something, but do something. You might say to your children, be nice to your sister. Right? What does that mean? Right? Don't hit her. Right? Don't lock her in the garage. Right? Don't eat her food, right? So you can more specify what are your general norms. Be good to your sister. That's what we want you to do. Well, what does that mean, Dad? All right? Don't hit her. Don't lock her in the garage. There's much more than just obviously not hitting and not locking in the garage. But if you're doing those, you know you're going wrong. Be nice to your sister means to help her, to be kind to her, to, to uh, make her feel good about herself. But we know some things that are absolutely incompatible with being nice to your sister. So we were talking about you should protect the good of union. And we could say things, be faithful, be thoughtful, seek the happiness of the other. If you really love a person, you are going to be faithful. Right? If you, you, we all know that one of the most devastating things to any relationship is infidelity. You're telling one person, I love you, I love you wildly, I care for you, you're the one and only to me, and you're telling another person the same thing. That's a lie. And we feel lied to. We feel betrayed. We feel very hurt. So someone who truly loves someone is going to be faithful, be thoughtful, seek the happiness of the other. You say, well, can we be more specific? Are there certain activities, again, that are totally incompatible with this? Again, no adultery. Adultery is absolutely incompatible with protecting the good of union. It's absolutely incompatible with being faithful. You say, well, dear, I love you. I love you. I've married you. 
uh, well, yes, I find her attractive too, but I married you. <laughs> We're not convinced by this, all right? We understand that if someone truly loves us, again, we have this exclusive relationship with this person. It's an act of total self-giving. And if you're giving to her, you're not giving yourself completely to me because you're saving some of the best of yourself for her, and I deserve all your best. I'm the one to whom you have made this commitment if I'm your wife or I'm your husband. So we all think that adultery, I'll go into these more completely, divorce, sexual abuse, and premarital sex, uh, I don't know if we all think, but certainly the church thinks that all of these things are incompatible with um, the goods of union. Now we also say that, all right, sexual intercourse has two purposes. One, I bond with this person. The second is the two of us may have children together. So you can say, if you're going to be protect the good of pre procreation, you must learn to be a good parent, good, learn good parenting skills, or save to provide for your children. It's good. How much do I save? What is a good parenting skill? Well, first of all, it's not a good parenting skill if you're not married. <laughs> Again, the getting, having sex before marriage is not a good parenting skill. Uh, you haven't ensured that your child is going to have a mother or a father. Right? You may be the sole person now providing for this child. So you should refrain from having sex before marriage so that you can be a good parent, meaning I'm going to also provide a, a father and I'm going to provide a mother for the children of, uh, that come through my being. I will also explain as we go along why contraceptives and in vitro fertilization are also violations of the good of procreation. So this is really what we're going to want to talk about uh, at the moment, our different acts that we think are violations of these goods, are violations of the good of union, or violations of the good of procreation, or as most likely is the case, violations of both. I have a list up here. It's going to get longer as we go along, and I, I, I could add cer certain things, and I will add certain things to, to this list. Abuses of the virtue of chastity. Abuses of the virtue of self-control over your sexuality. Abuses of the skill of using your sexuality responsibly and as a human being ought to use them. That these things are things that, that people to some degree generally or at least some of these, people would generally think are not good uses of sexuality. We've talked about adultery. Adultery is an extremely important uh, instance on this list. Because after all, the, there's only one commandment. Well, there's two commandments about sexuality. One about, about lusting and the other is about unfaithfulness. But they're both largely about unfaithfulness. Thou shalt not commit adultery. All sexual sins are considered to be under the sixth commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You notice there's no commandment on thou shalt not commit sexual abuse, thou shalt not masturbate, thou shalt not read pornography, none of these others. Why not? Isn't sexual abuse, or we could, well, obviously I should have had rape up here, right? There's no, there's no commandment against rape. Now, why not? <laughs> Surely rape is every bit as bad as adultery. Surely sexual abuse and incest are every bit as bad as adultery. Why are, is there no commandment against them? Well, it's the same way in which you, um, you might tell your son, don't hit your sister. Okay? That also means don't throw her clothes out in the backyard. That also means uh, don't uh, tear apart her dolls. Right? You, don't give her, give him, you don't give him a lengthy laundry list of all the things that would be a violation of giving uh, what it means to be not nice to your sister. Uh, what, what God is telling us with the commandments is some examples, some examples of behavior that are absolutely incompatible with the goods that are important to human life. The good of sexuality is obviously very fundamental to the good of human life. And he gives us adultery. Because first of all, he's telling us that sex belongs within marriage. So sex outside of marriage is wrong. It covers a lot of these. It covers premarital sex, covers sexual abuse, covers incest, covers well, virtually all of them. Right? That if you have sex outside of marriage in any way, you are violating the goods of marriage. Adultery is the most obvious one. You're having sex with someone who is other than your spouse. You have made a pledge and a commitment, which you in your heart wanted to make, and you in your heart felt was extremely appropriate to make. I'm going to love you till death do us part, for better or worse, in sickness and health. And that's how I feel. And I can see that those feelings, I know that those feelings are totally compatible with the relationship that I feel for you, right? with what, what I'm committing myself to is appropriate to these feelings, is appropriate to the sexual intercourse that we're going to be engaging in. I'm taking an oath that I believe is totally compatible, that expresses the deepest desires of my heart. A little bit later, you break that oath. 
Now, why? Well, it could be all sorts of reasons. But obviously, there's some sort of disillusionment. There's someone else who's appeared attracted to you. You don't have the virtue of chastity, most likely. You don't have the virtue of self-control. All the energy that you're putting into this new relationship, if you put it into the relationship at home, it might get a whole lot better, right? But you are stepping outside of the bounds of what is good. You took a vow. You took a vow to remain faithful to this individual, and now you are breaking that vow. That vow is appropriate to the goods of this relationship. So the first thing to notice is that adultery, again, violates the good of union, because the union means with this person, this person only. It also violates the good of procreation. It also violates the good of babies, because obviously you shouldn't be having children with anybody other than your spouse, right? So if you're having sexual intercourse with a mistress or with some man, if you're a woman, right, you could bring a child into this world, a child which the two of you are not prepared to be parents for. So adultery violates not only the good of union, but it also violates the good of uh, procreation. It also violates probably the good of the children who are at home, right? He's the adulterer, the man or the woman, are putting his or her energies into courting someone else, uh, being with someone else, giving all your, we only have so many energies in a day, you know, come home tired after work, uh, wanting to play with people, wanting to be nice to them, wanting to engage, listen to their interests and everything, that takes energy. And we're squandering it on someone else. If we're listen, telling someone else our stories, listening to someone else's stories, rather than telling them to our spouse and listening to our spouse and listening to our children. So there's a real squandering of energies in an adulterous relationship that belong at home. So there's many ways in which adultery is a, a violation of the goods of sexuality. They're a violation of your spouse, they're a violation of the, the children you do have, they're a violation of children that you, you might have. Right? Now the same thing with premarital sexual intercourse. Again, I'm making this claim that your sexual powers belong to your spouse. And when I give talks about premarital sexual intercourse to young people, I always ask them, how many of you want to be faithful to your spouse through your whole life? They all raise their hands. I say, and how many of you want your spouse to be faithful through your whole life? They all raise their hands. And I say, well, why not start now? Why not start now being faithful to the person you're going to marry? And why not say, now, my sexuality belongs to the person I'm going to marry? When he or she comes along, I'm going to be able to say, I knew, you were, I knew you'd show up sometime. I knew someone as wonderful as you would come into my orbit, if you would. And I'm saving something very special for you. I want this self-giving, this intimate relationship, this revealing of myself, this disclosing of myself that happens through sexuality. I want that to happen only with you, because I knew how much I'd love you, and I knew how much you would love me, and I wanted to protect this good for you. It's a great gift to give to your, to your future spouse, is to remain chaste before marriage. Same thing, of course, with children. You ask young people, how many of you want to be good parents? They all raise their hands. How many of you want to have a father around? They all raise their hands. How many of you want to have a mother around? They all raise their hands. Right? How many want to have both? They all raise their hands. Right? You say, I say, well, you know, if you have sex outside of marriage, you could be putting yourself in the position of having a child for whom you wouldn't be providing a mother or a father, right? That you would be have, causing this child to be raised in a single parent household. Now, I have, obvious, I have family members, I have good friends who are single parents and they're doing a great job, but they too would agree that they'd much rather have a spouse around to help them out, to be the other parent to the child, right? And I'm not saying that any child raised in a single parent household is going to turn out terribly, nothing like that, but that all of us would prefer to have a mother and a father around and to provide a mother and a father for children and that by having premarital sexual intercourse you're putting yourself in a position where you could be creating a situation for your children, the children you're going to love more than any other children, which isn't good for them. There are many other problems with premarital sexual intercourse that we, we can see, I think, uh, maybe more clearly having discussed John Paul II's understanding of the development of a loving relationship that premarital sexual intercourse, in a certain sense, short circuits this process of growing in love and growing in sympathy and growing in friendship, all right, and growing in this respect for the other person as a person. It often can happen that young people, we see this all the time, that young people have sexual intercourse. And I, I worked one time at a pregnancy help center. We get these young girls coming in who had sex with their boyfriends, maybe 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 years of age. We had an interesting question we asked them. We always asked them, has having sex improved your relationship with your boyfriend? And they would always say, 
And they sit there and I think and they go, wow, what a question. And I say, no. As a matter of fact, it hasn't. He used to pay some attention to me. He used to want to go to the mall with me and go to movies with me and go to walks. Now he wants to go have sex and it's hello, goodbye. He's gone. And we're kind of embarrassed to see each other in the hallway at school. Uh, I wonder if he's talking about me with the guys in the, in the locker room. I don't know, right? Now, if you're married, you don't have those worries, right? If you're married, you have a complete life with each other. But, but before you get married, you sort of, you use each other and you feel embarrassed about it. And you may not be getting to know each other very well. Sex can loom very large. As John Paul II says here, sex is, is, is an intensely pleasurable response. Again, you can bond with this person who you might not much like, right? And you will find yourself uh, having a relationship with someone who might not be a suitable uh, person for you. I talked a minute ago about some friends of mine who had had sexual intercourse before marriage and that their experience after marriage then was that they thought sexual intercourse had a sort of naughty um, flavor to it and it took them quite a while to, to get, be free and spontaneous and feel that they in fact were doing something good and not doing something naughty. Much of that can happen again with premarital sexual intercourse. Most people who are having sex outside of marriage are in a cer certain sense sneaking around. In the modern age you, you can be more open about it. But there's usually a period of time where you're lying to people. You're lying to your friends or your parents or your teachers or someone. It's not a good idea to get in the practice of lying. It's not a good idea to get in the practice of lying about uh, your most intimate relationships. It's not a good idea for the person who loves you to know that you are successful in deceiving people about what you're doing. Because you get married and after you get married you say, well, he was very good at lying to his parents. She was very good at lying to her parents. Maybe she's very good at lying to me. There's something intrinsically dishonest about premarital sexual intercourse that causes uh, great problems, it seems to me, for marriage um, afterwards. Not to mention, again, the difficulties that one puts oneself into. I think I mentioned earlier that, uh, not in this, this class period, but in an earlier one, that almost any breakup of a romantic relationship is hurtful. You have, to a certain extent, begun to give of yourself to another person, to expose yourself to another person. Again, you may have done this whole business that John Paul II talks about in, in, in endowing this person with all these virtues and characteristics. This person dumps you. You're very hurt. Or you might become very disillusioned. I thought he was this way, he's that way, I'm going to dump him. One or the other or both get hurt. If you've been involved in a sexual relationship, that hurt is all that much greater. And your ability to really give yourself completely to another person in the future might actually be diminished. You might say, I've lied to people before. I've told them I've loved them, and I guess I didn't. Other people have told me that they've loved me and would be with me forever. They weren't. Who can I trust? Can I trust myself? Can I trust other people? There's an incredible amount of over-involvement with uh, premarital sexual intercourse that gets you more deeply involved with this person before you have really pledged the kind of involvement that you've gotten yourselves into. So there's many reasons um, for refraining from sexual intercourse before marriage. Primarily, again, because it violates the goods of sexuality. It violates the goods of union. It violates the goods of, of procreation. And it also treats the other person as though that person uh, weren't deserving of a lifetime committed uh, loving relationship. Now, we can look at maybe one more of these before we stop for this, this class period. Divorce, again. Very difficult. 50% of marriages in our society uh, end in divorce. Now, clearly, there's an enormous amount of heartbreak with divorce. The most amazing thing is, is that they've done studies that show that most people, 10 years after they've gotten married, are no more happier than they were when they got divorced. Right? People think when they get divorced, they're going to buy themselves some happiness. They're going to get out of a relationship uh, that is unpleasant. And certainly for a period of time, they generally feel that they have done so. Now, I'm not saying, of course, that, any, uh, that all marriages have to stick together that if there's an abusive, physically abusive, emotionally abusive uh, relationship, separation may certainly be necessary. But we're talking when we're talking about 50% of marriages ending in divorce in the United States, you're not talking about 50% of abusive situations. You're often talking about relationships that have started off on the wrong foot, where people haven't really gotten to know each other, and they get married, and the sexual desire was very strong. And now after they get married, they figure out, they find that they this isn't the person they thought they married. I thought you were this and you're not this. I thought you were that and you're not that. Because you got in prematurely. That doesn't mean that situation can't be healed and can't be fixed. All right? It's time that you got to know each other. It's time that you built some common relation, common interest together. A great common interest, of course, is children. 
uh, it really tends to make people grow up. It makes ten tends to people make people overlook things that might be bothersome about another person because this is the father of my children. This is the mother of my children. We need to get along in order to raise these children together. And of course, divorce is, the studies now show that divorce, it, and people could have figured this out without a study, that, div that divorce is, is very damaging to children, that they feel abandoned. Um, they're very confused about how much their parents love them, um, who loves them, can you trust anybody, uh, there are all the dynamics of a divorce, living in two different households, getting together for holidays, extremely stressful. I find that my students, again, when I ask them about marriage, I said, do you want to have a marriage that lasts? They all say yes. Young people hate divorce. Either they have seen the damages of, a, of an intact, of a divorced household in their own lives, or if they have seen it in their friends. So we've covered now three elements, premarital sex, adultery, and divorce. We'll take up the others in the next class period. In this segment, we're going to complete our consideration of some of the abuses of the virtue of chastity or abuses of the goods of sexuality. We covered somewhat briefly premarital sexual intercourse, adultery, and divorce. And we'll now talk about a few of the other items on our list and a few that aren't actually up on the chart. Talk about sexual abuse, which might be one of the most easy ones for us to see that it's wrong. It's an act of an older person with a younger person, largely a person, young child in the same family, though it need not be. Obviously, daycare centers are, have been uh, places where sexual abuse has, has occurred. Worth thinking, though, again, uh, about this situation is why it's wrong. And this will help us see what, how sexuality ought to be used. What's wrong with having sex with children, right? Okay, it's inappropriate because they can't share in the goods of sexuality. There's no real bonding and union going on here. There's no love for this person, right? This is a pure sexual desire. You can't really say that this man or this woman who's engaging in sexual abuse has an interest in the personhood of the child, right? Obviously, um, perhaps the children e e child is even pre-puberty, but there's no interest in the goods of procreation in this union. Something totally inappropriate about this kind of love in this kind of relationship. Well, I'm trying to show that those same inappropriateness are really in the other abuses against sexuality, as well as something as, as manifest as sexual abuse. Another one I don't have on the chart is rape. It's another one I often start when I'm teaching sexual ethics to college students with the act of rape. And I will ask them, we all agree. We all agree that sexual abuse is wrong. We all agree that uh, rape is wrong. I'll say, why, why is rape wrong? Why is it so obviously wrong, right? Well, because it's, it's against the will of a woman and it's a violent act. You think both of those things are completely incompatible with love, right? Violence is incompatible with love and doing something against the will of a person is incompatible with love. And since sexual intercourse should be the expression of love, since sexual intercourse should be the expression of love, rape is clearly incompatible with love. But then when you look at this, when you say, all right, the personhood of the woman should be respected, I want to ask, is a personhood of the woman being respected with premarital sex, with adultery, with divorce? I've given reasons why I think there too, the personhood of the woman is not being respected. Obviously those are acts aren't acts of violent sexuality, but still you're not looking out for the well-being, the full well-being of the personhood of the other individual uh, involved. Well, let's talk about the act of masturbation. It's a very controversial act in our day. Many psychologists think that it's just a natural act. It's a, another alternative form of sexual expression, that it's a phase that people go through in their life, maybe at different times in their life, whereas the church again calls it another sin against the goods of sexuality. Now, sexual intercourse is stimulating one's own sexual organs for the purposes of sexual pleasure. And as John Paul II said, the body shows the, the body shows that it's meant for union with another. Our sexual organs are clearly made to fit with the members of the opposite sex sexual organs. That's what they're for. And to use them for your own self-pleasure, again, turns back on yourself something that you should be offering to your beloved spouse, right? Uh, Aristophanes, in Plato's dialogue, the symposium, has a wonderful portrait of love. He, the whole symposium is trying to define love. And at one point he says that, well, really love is what we were initially. He says that human beings were initially one big ball, that we had four arms and four legs and four eyes. 
a new general organs because we were all bound together. But we got cut in half. And when we got cut in half, all right, that's when the genital organs came into being. And that we spent our whole life sort of chasing Orion, trying to find our other half, trying to find our fit. There's something wonderful again about sexual desire for that reason. It brings us out of ourselves, all right? If we had no sexual desires, right, the possibility of women really wanting to relate to men or men really wanting to relate with women might be somewhat minimal, all right? That one of the major motivating factors for us learning social skills, for us to learn how to, to, to talk to people, how to be polite, to learn manners, is because we want to be attractive to a member of the opposite sex. And masturbation, again, turns that sexual impulse inward. Instead of saying, my goodness, you know, I've really got these sexual desires, I've got to learn how to integrate them into the whole of my life. I need to find myself a spouse. I need to find myself who, someone who will love me and make it that I would never think of having to uh, engage in an act of uh, uh, self-stimulation. So the reason that, sexual that masturbation is considered to be wrong is it's a misuse of this gift that God has given one, which is an other-directed gift, one that's directed towards another person. Again, there's, in all of these acts, there's a wide range that we need to keep in mind of what we would call culpability, right? How responsible you are for this action. When it's deliberately chosen and when it's a, uh, maybe it's youthful experimentation and one doesn't really have a full sense of what one's doing, one's being teased by one's friends, pressured by people, it could be very different from an adult who might choose uh, to do this very deliberately and knowing very much that, that it's wrong. So one thing to keep in mind with all of these actions, and it will come into play, I think, particularly with our discussion of homosexuality, is there's a g wide range of what we call subjective culpability for any action, who is actually fully responsible for the kind of acts that they engage in. In fact, sexual abuse, or even particularly, you might say, pedophilia, we're not altogether clear on how much moral responsibility those who engage in such an act have. They seem to have some sort of split in their psyche between themselves as sort of an adult human being, a responsible human being, and someone who does these other actions. And it might really be a profound psychological disorder more than a, um, a moral act that engages the full human being. Incest, again, is very much like sexual abuse. It's the having sex with someone with whom one ought not to. It's a form of sexual abuse. Again, this draws us to, again, most of us would readily see that incest is wrong. Uh, and we're even offended by some movie stars who have uh, sexual intercourse with their adopted or adoptee uh, daughters, that we think that this is a violation of the relationship, that there are certain loves and there are certain expressions of love that are appropriate to certain relationships. A love for a father for his daughter, a mother for her son, a brother for a sister, is one kind of love in which sexual expression is absolutely inappropriate. It's inappropriate, again, because the kind of intimacy and bonding that comes with sexual intercourse is not appropriate for those relationships. The possibility of having children is not appropriate for those relationships. So this notion, and there are modern uh, thinkers, psychologists, even philosophers, who think that wherever you get your sexual kicks, it's OK. <laughs> right? We're just bodies, and another body might satisfy us, whether it be a child, be a relative, be a member of the same sex. It doesn't matter. Right? Whereas the church says it does matter. There's a certain sort of love that's appropriate for sexual intercourse, that's, that sexual intercourse is the appropriate expression of a certain kind of love. And if that love isn't present, i.e. the love between male and female within marriage, then the use of the sexual powers is inappropriate. The final one I have up here is polygamy. I also should have put up uh, prostitution as being uh, a violation of the virtue of chastity or the goods of sexuality. Polygamy, obviously, is having many wives. Many cultures have thought polygamy is moral. Uh, the Catholic Church says that only monogamy is moral. That again, a person desire, deserves, in a certain sense, the uh, um, focused love of one other person, the unconditional focused love of another person. And polygamy would be a violation of that. Prostitution is selling something that should only be given away. And it should only be given away, obviously, from what I've said, uh, within marriage. Sometimes pondering why we have these immediate gut reactions to the evil of prostitution, to the evil of rape, to the evil of sexual abuse, to the evil of incest, can help us get at what is the appropriate use of sexuality and why sexuality belongs only within marriage. Now, the final topic I'm going to discuss in this segment is homosexuality. A couple of texts I'd like to recommend on this topic. One is 
two of them are written by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. One is the Declaration on Certain Questions Concerning Sexual Ethics. The second is the Letter to the Bishops of the Catholic Church on the Pastoral Care of Homosexual Persons. These are both, again, largely theological documents with an uh, emphasis on natural law, readily available through such sources as the Daughters of St. Paul. Another book that's of extreme usefulness is by John Harvey called The Homosexual Person, New Thinking in Pastoral Care. Father Harvey is also the founder of Courage, which is a national organization, unfortunately not in every city and sometimes uh, not readily available to people, but an organization that helps cur uh, homosexuals live with their homosexual orientation. Father Harvey has had uh, decades of experience of care for homosexual persons and has, has done a marvelous job in helping us think through how to help uh, homosexuals live with their orientation. John Nicolosi is a psychologist uh, who has written this book, Reparative Therapy of Male Homosexuality. He's one of the founding members of NARTH, the National Association for Research and Treatment of Homosexuality. Uh, he belongs to a group of psychologists and psychiatrists who think that homosexuality is a treatable condition. Right, which is at odds with the current view of the American Psychiatric uh, Association. Now, there's few topics that require greater sensitivity um, than that of homosexuality. It's a condition that actually remains very little understood, both by psychologists and uh, by the general public. It's not even agreed on how common homosexuality is. Uh, you can hear statistics as high as 10% of the male population has had a homosexual experience down to under 2% really have a true homosexual orientation. Um, many people claim to have uh, an attraction, uh, uh, their, that their sole attraction, sexual attraction, is to members of the same sex. Other people will say that at, at times in their life they've been sexually attracted to members of their own sex. So I guess you would call the, the, the true homosexual one who says he's not, he or she has had no sexual attraction for members of the opposite sex. But many people, again, there's a broad range that people during their lifetime often will have uh, an attraction to the member, to some, a member of their own sex, maybe having a particularly intense relationship, an intense friendship, particularly you might say during adolescence or college, a uh, time in your life perhaps where you might be extremely lonely and alienated and particularly unsuccessful with the opposite sex. A member of the same sex might then um, ha hold some sexual attraction, which wouldn't m mean necessarily that you are, in fact, a, a homosexual. Now, many in modern society would like to proclaim homosexual sexual acts to be recognized as completely moral and would like homosexual unions to be treated as legitimate uh, alternative life arrangements or modes of partnership or families or unions. But it's been throughout the whole tradition of the Judeo-Christian thought that homosexuality, homosexuality has been considered to be incompatible with God's plan for sexuality. That's clear both in scripture, though there are those who challenge readings of scripture, uh, certainly within the tradition and even with natural, certainly with natural law principles, that the church has taught that the only proper sexual activity is between a male and a female who are married to each other and who are open to having children. Now, in a sexual intercourse is meant to be an expression of love between those of the opposite sex and who are married to each other, and that sexual intercourse uh, between members of the same sex is considered to be a misuse of the gift of sexuality. It does not serve to create a bond between male and female. It can't serve the purpose of bringing forth new human life. And in fact, it creates an inappropriate bond between members of the same sex. Some people would say that the wrongness of homosexuality is perfectly obvious, again, when you consider the fit that there is between the genital organs of the male and the female that this is clearly the kind of union that God had in mind, that God made male for female and female for male. Yet we have this phenomenon, that we have people who claim, and we have no reason to doubt them, obviously, that, they're, that they feel very attracted to members of their own sex, and they feel that this attraction is one that is permanent, and they feel that it is irreversible. Some people, again, have that attraction, perhaps, to one particular individual at a particular time um, in their lives. Again, we have very little information or knowledge on the source of this attraction. Uh, most pe people claim that it's not chosen. It's not something you sort of say, well, I could either be a homosexual, homosexual or be a heterosexual. I can choose. Most people don't feel that it was chosen. It feels that it's something that, that they have, whether they were born with it or whether it was the result of some early childhood experiences. 
uh, they really don't sense that it was something that they said, I could be either homosexual or heterosexual, I will choose. The American Psychiatric Association has held various positions uh, on the subject and how normal it is and how it comes about, which shows more than anything else that we simply don't yet understand. Now, some people want to claim, again, that the homosexual orientation is, is natural and normal. Uh, some people are born with blue eyes, some people are born with green eyes, some people are born heterosexual, some people are born heter homosexual. It's just something that's given to us uh, at birth. And since they think it's natural, uh, in that sense, being innate, being born in someone, they would say that uh, then we shouldn't disapprove of it. Uh, we shouldn't consider it a disordered condition if it's one, in fact, that you're born with and you can't help. In fact, some people claim that there's even some evidence that there is some genetic uh, predisposition to homosexuality. That's questionable, but even if there were, this doesn't necessarily uh, challenge the church's teaching that homosexual, homosexual, con the homosexual condition is an unnatural and disordered uh, condition. Uh, why is that? If we could say that this individual seems to have been born this way, we might even be able to identify the gene which uh, makes for homosexuality. How could we say that it's an unnatural condition? Well, natural doesn't simply mean what you're born with. Again, you might be born without an arm. That wouldn't be natural. It's natural to have two arms. You might be born blind, and that's not natural. It's natural to have eyesight. Right? So the word nature here means much as we were talking at, at the first segments of this uh, series. Natural means what's in accord with the, with the nature and the dignity of man. Man in his wholeness and man in his perfection. And we could be born, and we, most of us are born, with different propensities uh, to things that we ought not to follow up on. Some of us are, seem to have been born irritable. Right? Some people seem to have been born generous. Some people seem to have been born kind of mean. Some people seem to have been born extremely patient. <laughs> say, where do they get this way? You say, I've been trying for years to be that way, and I, I can't seem to, to pull it off. And you look at their parents, and their parents are sanguine like that. They might be even-tempered, and you say, well, it seems to be genetic, or it seems to be they've been raised that way. Well, we, there's some evidence that uh, some ethnic groups have a greater propensity, say, towards alcoholism than, than other groups. It seems like it might be uh, genetic. And you say, well, th that genetic condition then doesn't make it uh, right. It just means that, you, again, you didn't choose it. You were born with it. You didn't choose to be born without an arm. You didn't choose to be born blind. And you may not have chosen to be homosexual. It may be a condition that you have that you're not responsible for choosing, but it nonetheless uh, is your, your condition. Let me just put a few these little bullets up here. You might follow some of this as we, we go along. Now, the, the, the point here is, whether we're born disordered or we become disordered, we are all disordered. We are all disordered in many ways. Um, most of us want to eat more than we should, want to sleep more than we should, and almost every one of us wants to have sex in ways that we shouldn't, with people that we shouldn't, at times that we shouldn't, in places that we shouldn't. It'd be very rare to find a, a human being who has their sexual, or, sexual his or her sexual uh, desires completely ordered, only wants to have sexual intercourse with his or her spouse, only wants to have it when it's appropriate to have it, only wants to have it as often as the other individual wants to have it. It doesn't happen, all right? We are in what's called a fallen state, all right? We are all uh, um, living in the aftermath of the fall, in the aftermath of original sin. So simply having it, calling it a disordered condition, many people are offended that, that, uh, sexual, that homosexuality might be called a disordered condition, that it would be unnatural. And they say that this seems derogatory uh, towards homosexuality and somehow deserving of special censoring uh, by the church. I'm certain that some people have understood it that way. I'm certain the church does not mean it that way. Uh, that if one finds oneself with a homosexual orientation, it doesn't mean that one is a horrible human being or, or worse than the rest of us. Right? It simply means that one has a particular difficulty to struggle with. Uh, again, those of us can find ourselves being lazy or greedy or irritable. We say we have a particular propensity with which we have uh, to struggle, that we need to learn how to live with and how to put order into our disordered being. As a matter of fact, that's what we could say that the, 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 life, the moral life generally is, is a life of trying to put order into a disordered condition. So it's extremely important to understand, it's extremely important to understand that the church does not teach that the homosexual condition, if one has a homosexual orientation or even 
a momentary homosexual desire or even a homosexual desire over a certain period of life or even if you feel that it's permanent, that you are therefore sinful or bad because you have that orientation. There is nothing of that in the church's teaching. Again, we all have disordered passions of one kind or another. It's possible that most people at some time in their life do have homosexual uh, desires. Those desires in and of themselves does not, do not mean that you are a bad or sinful person. Again, it's what you do with it. It's how you act upon it. Now, again, some of us are very irritable and hot-tempered, it seems, by nature. And again, our feeling that way is not necessarily wrong. If someone does something that makes us irritable, feel irritable, we have to act in a certain way. We have to respond, and we could respond kindly even though we feel uh, irritable. So we have to try to live with whatever conditions or orientations we have. Now, some people say that this seems unfair, again, that uh, the homosexual orientation seems to go so deeply into one's being, right? And that with alcoholism, sure, you give up drinking, but you're not giving up uh, all that much. You can live without alcohol. But it seems that homosexuality, it seems to be giving, not on, uh, giving up not only sexual activity, but it seems to be giving up intimacy, right? That so much of our intimacy seems to be uh, brought to us through our sexual relationships. And every human heart has a great need for intimacy and love and belonging to another. It seems particularly hard to say that homosexuals are going to be denied that kind of deep and intimate uh, relationship. Of course, there's also, there's, uh, now, the point is that many people do live a celibate life, even those who are not homosexual. We obviously, in the Catholic Church, we have the great tradition of, of priests and nuns who live a life without sexual intercourse. But they ha can have lives of great um, psychosexual wholeness, all right? They may not have genital acts, but they can still completely appreciate their sexual beings as men and women and what is brought with that as far as relating with, with other people. They can have intimate relationships with each other. You can have intimate relations. Sometimes people, even married people, their most intimate relationship is not with their spouse. It could be with their best friend or their sister or their father. All right, we do want and seek intimate relationships in our sexual relationships. We don't always get them. So intimate intimacy can be found in many different uh, parts of life. Some people would say, well, that's, a, that's not a good comparison because priests and nuns choose the life. They make a choice to be celibate, whereas homosexuals aren't choosing, again, their condition. It's something that is, it comes to them in their life. Either they're born that way or they become that way, but they don't, again, feel that they've chosen it. So those of us, others, they think, uh, who are celibate have chosen that condition. Well, I'm not sure that's exactly right. It seems to me there's many people in this world who are celibate who haven't chosen it. Uh, there are those who haven't succeeded in finding a spouse. There are those whose spouses have left them, uh, who have been abandoned by a spouse and now live as a single parent and don't feel that they can enter another relationship either because they feel their marriage is valid or they feel so damaged by the first relationship they can't imagine another one. You have people with severe physical or psychological disabilities who may never be able to enter into a sexual uh, relationship. They have needs of intimacy, which again, we pray and hope that can be satisfied by other people reaching out to them, them reaching out to people by uh, a very profound and deep uh, prayer life that Christ himself promises to be our first friend, that Christ promises to inhabit our hearts and be there with us, with us always. So there are certain objections against uh, celibacy that seems to me uh, not to stand up. And this is what the church does require of homosexuals, that though they may have a homosexual orientation, again, which is not sinful, to act upon that homosexual orientation, to engage in homosexual sexual acts, would be considered to be wrong, to be going against the good of, um, of sexuality. Now the question is, well, could we expect such individuals to attempt to change? Could we expect them to attempt to change their orientation? Again, there's, it's highly controversial whether or not they can. Uh, there are certain groups of homosexuals homosexual therapists, uh, I mentioned some earlier, uh, Nicolosi at Narth, um, who think that many homosexuals can, over a period of time, a year, two years, five years of therapy, can change their homosexual orientation. There are many evangelical groups, one called Exodus, that has worked very hard um, to assist homosexuals in reorienting themselves. Now this doesn't necessarily mean that they no longer will have a sexual attraction for members of their own sex. What it does mean is they can successfully have sexual attractions for members of the opposite sex, and that they can enter into relationships uh, with members of the opposite sex that will be fulfilling and lifelong and happy. 
Again, it doesn't mean that they will become completely heterosexual uh, in their orientation, but that they can live a heterosexual lifestyle. Now again, there's no requirement that a homosexual, in fact, even particularly try to change his or her orientation. He or she may find that unthinkably difficult, uh, not have the money for therapy, not have the time for therapy. But again, one can uh, still live a celibate life, even though one may not be uh, attempting to overcome one's homosexuality. One final thing needs to be addressed, which is homophobia. Now, homophobia is considered to be the hatred of homosexuals. And it's a, a very real and very wrong uh, approach to those who have a homosexual orientation. Again, from what I understand the church is teaching, homosexual orientation is really no worse than a propensity towards irritability, meanness, greed, and probably much less worse because those are other directed and hostile with homosexuality is not other directed and hostile, all right? It may be other directed actually and, and, and loving. So um, we shouldn't hate people who are greedy. We shouldn't hate people who are lazy. And we should pray for them. We should love them. We should be kind to them. And the same with homosexuals. There is no place for homophobia um, in the Catholic Church and in a good society.